Lecture 15, on Ethics, Contemporary Moral Problems. Telling Lies, Applied Ethics 7. I'm not upset that you lied to me, I'm upset that, from now on, I can't believe you. Friedrich Nietzsche. 1. Introduction, our text opens this chapter, as philosophers often do, by questioning the obvious, what is it to tell a lie? Our text asks, is it always wrong to lie? This is another of the old ethical questions that date back to the earliest human interactions. Indeed, the ethics of lying has been used in examples multiple times in this series of lectures, but in this chapter, it takes center stage. We know that there are punishments for lying in many situations, though the punishments from our parents may not be as harsh as the punishments for perjury under federal law. We are warned against lying from our very youth, by every authority figure in our lives. Indeed, honesty is a virtue touted by nearly every institution, be they financial, religious, political, etc. Everyone wants an honest face. In this chapter, we will analyze lying through the major ethical lenses we've examined in our text so far. 2. What is it to lie? It is actually quite common to get this mixed up. I can recall many instances of friends and acquaintances saying things like, oops, I lied, when they learned that they were wrong about something they said. I also once met a young woman who was incredibly pretentious and who had recently undergone a religious conversion. She claimed to be averse to education after having left university because of all the lies. She would go on and on about what she called, the world, and all its lies and how college professors were spreading the lies of, the world. It turned out that anything she heard that didn't conform to her religious scriptures she would call, lies. Is it clear what's wrong with these first examples? To elucidate this, let us first examine our text's examples and ask ourselves whether there is a proper lie involved in any as we read them. 1. A friend asks you where you went on vacation last year. You say, Cambridge, which they understand to be Cambridge, UK, but you really mean Cambridge, Massachusetts. 2. You are teaching chemistry to primary school children, and you hold up a soccer ball and say, atoms are just like this. 3. You are having a really bad day, your partner has split up with you, you have lost your house keys, and your friend just shouted at you. You meet an acquaintance in the corridor, they say, how are you? You say, fine thanks, and you? 4. Your grandmother has saved up her pension, bought some wool, and knitted you a jumper. You hate it. She is visiting you and you put it on. She asks, smiling, so, do you really like it? You reply, of course grandma, thanks so much for thinking about me. 5. You are taking a math test and one question asks the solution to sink squared plus cosk squared and you write, 10, the answer is, 1. 6. A recent divorcee keeps wearing his wedding ring. 7. You are smuggling Bibles into China. At the border, the guards ask you what you have in your truck. As it happens, you have hundreds of Bibles, so you say, oh, hundreds of Bibles. The guards think this is a joke and wave you through. Now, did any of these seven examples constitute lying? Let us evaluate them each in turn before returning to the first two examples to apply what we will learn about lying from our text's seven examples. Example 1 is merely an honest mistake on the part of the friend asking about your vacation. You meant Cambridge, Massachusetts, but the only Cambridge your friend is aware of is in the UK. Example 2 is a little more difficult. Our text identifies it as a lie, though not necessarily an immoral one. This is because you cannot communicate all of the details of chemistry in a single class to young children. However, I would argue that this isn't a proper example of a lie, merely an explanation by analogy. Atoms are often illustrated as round and containing mostly empty space, much like a soccer ball. When you give an analogy to help someone understand something, you are not claiming that everything about the compared objects are perfectly identical, only relevantly similar enough to aid in understanding. For example, when we describe the movement of electricity, we use the analogy of flowing liquid. The electricity flows through wires like water through tubes, but they are not exactly the same thing. 
and as imperfect as the analogy between water and electricity, we might not be able to improve upon the conception of flowing when describing the movement of electricity. Example 3 doesn't appear to be a lie either. After all, fine isn't the same as great, but you will survive. Furthermore, it is merely a customary gesture of friendliness. If it was a simple, good morning, you typically wouldn't respond with, no it isn't, and saying good morning back wouldn't seem like a lie either. Further still, replying to this customary greeting with anything else may be inappropriate. Stopping someone in passing to explain why you're not fine would seem like a cry for help, and make someone who was just trying to be polite feel as though they need to abandon their business to help you. Perhaps they will feel the unpleasant need to abandon the polite custom of asking how people are in passing, but, at any rate, this does not appear to be a proper lie. Example 4, however, does seem to be a lie. Telling someone something that you know is not true with the intention of deceiving them is lying, though, in this case perhaps just a little white lie. In example 5 there is no lying taking place, just miscalculation. Example 6 could be an example of lying if the motivation was to lead others to believe he was married, but if he couldn't take it off because of attachment or hadn't yet come to terms with the divorce, then that may not be lying. Example 7 also appears not to be a lie if the intentions were honest, but the guard interpreted it as a joke. The takeaway from all of these examples is that lies are not merely saying something that is false, as in the first example I gave and the fifth example from our text. Lying is also not necessarily verbal, as we saw in example 6 with the wedding ring. However, in example 4 we see that all the boxes are checked for what constitutes lying something untrue is communicated with the intention of deceiving someone, in this case grandma, and even though it was done so from good intentions not to hurt grandma's feelings, it is nevertheless, a lie. If we look back to the second example I gave, we can see that she is misusing the term lie, as well. Even if everything that didn't agree with her religious scriptures was in fact false, her college professors are not part of some cabal intent on deceiving students by leading them away from some religious text, they are trying to teach subjects to which they have devoted a considerable amount of study and are sharing information that they believe to be true of those subjects. Therefore, if you are not knowingly sharing false information, for the purpose of deceiving someone, then you are not lying, though everyone is fallible, being wrong is not enough to constitute lying. 3. Utilitarianism Our text begins this section by reminding us that, what makes something good, on the utilitarian view, is whether it creates the greatest good for the greatest number of people, with good defined as either happiness, pleasure, well-being, or preference, depending on the version of utilitarianism we are considering. Therefore, we cannot determine the moral characterization of any act, including lying, independent of its context. Furthermore, every individual's good is equal to everyone else's in importance. For example, recall the trolley thought experiment. A utilitarian must pull the lever to divert the trolley away from the five, even if the one is a family member. Every individual's good is equal, but the number of individuals is not, since five is more than one, on this view, the family member must be sacrificed. Therefore, if the act of lying produces more good for more people than telling the truth, then lying in this case is morally good. Our text gives a further example to illustrate how this is intuitive in some cases. Consider a soldier, captured behind enemy lines and, despite being tortured, continues to lie to the enemy about ally codes, thereby saving hundreds of thousands of lives. From the utilitarian point of view, the soldier did exactly the right thing. However, there are other thought experiments that can skew this intuition. Our text has us consider an example from H. J. McCloskey, famously referred to as, McCloskey's Sheriff. Imagine a scenario where there has been a serious crime in a town and the sheriff is trying to prevent serious rioting. He knows that this rioting is likely to bring about destruction, injury, and maybe even death. The problem is that he has no leads, he has not the slightest idea who committed the crime. However, he can prevent these riots by lying to the town and framing an innocent man. No one will miss the man and he is hated in the town. If he frames and jails this innocent man, convincing people to believe that it was this man that committed the crime, then the town will be placated, and people will not riot. 
the consequentialist will judge in this case that it is morally required that the sheriff lies even if this means that an innocent man is jailed. This then shows that the fact that the consequentialist says it is sometimes morally required to lie can lead to counterintuitive conclusions. This is a more extreme version of example 4, in which we lie to grandma about liking the gift she knitted, to protect her feelings. For the utilitarian, if this lie leads to the greatest good for the greatest number of people, then, not only is it acceptable, it is morally required. However, as consequentialists, utilitarians need to ensure that their moral calculus is not too superficial. They need to consider the implications and possible second-order effects of their actions. Since we cannot see the future, we need to weigh the consequences of possibilities as well in our moral deliberation and ask ourselves if the possibility of grandma finding out that we lied and actually hate the gift is worth the initial discomfort of honesty. She may have taken the truth well. However, having learned that we lied to her, echoing Nietzsche, she will never know if she can trust her grandchildren again, possibly give up her beloved hobby of knitting, and fall into a depression that she does not have enough years left to overcome. This would be indeed tragic and shows the importance of deep reflection in consequentialist reasoning. Compared to McCloskey's sheriff, this is a low-stakes example, but nevertheless has the potential to result in tragedy. If we consider the second and third order effects in the sheriff example, we could potentially avoid worse consequences. 4. If we frame the innocent man and the real criminal issues a public confession, then, not only might rioting ensue, but public faith in law enforcement may degrade, leading to even worse consequences. In the end, perhaps lying isn't the right thing after all. 4. The Kantian and lying, in contrast to consequentialists, Deontologists like Kantians maintain that lying is always morally wrong independent of the consequences. While the utilitarian derives potentially good actions from principles of pleasure or utility, the Kantian derives good actions from a unique application of reason expressed in the categorical imperative. Lying fails the first formulation of the categorical imperative, also known as the universalizability principle, which states that we should act only according to that maxim through which we can at the same time will that it become a universal law. Since the maxim, everyone should lie when it benefits them, defeats the whole point of communication and destroys trust, it leads to a contradiction, and having led to a contradiction, is irrational. Since the maxim is irrational, it is also immoral. We can see also that lying fails the second formulation of the categorical imperative, also called, the formula of humanity, which states, so act that you use humanity, in your own person as well as in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never merely as a means. To treat someone as an end is to respect them as equally important rational beings. However, lying to someone disrespects them as rational beings because it taints the beliefs they will use in their deliberations, hindering their rational processes, and depriving them of decision-making opportunities. Lying, therefore, does not treat others as ends in and of themselves, so it is morally wrong. Our text points out that this doesn't seem right if we reconsider the tortured soldier example. However, the Kantian isn't committed to the conclusion that the soldier must tell the truth to the enemy but merely not lie to them. In this situation, the soldier can remain silent. In cases where you cannot remain silent, such as in the grandmother example, the truth can be sugarcoated yet remain the truth. So, there are ways to make Kant's approach less objectionable if we think hard enough about it. However, as our text also points out, there will always be cases where telling the truth will seem morally counterintuitive. 5. Some final thoughts about the political context, in this section, our text offers commentary on what has been popularly referred to as the post-truth era. The post-truth era, that our text argues was ushered in by the Donald Trump presidency, is characterized by a general distrust of historically honest institutions, politically polarized tribalist journalism, constant appeals to, and dissemination of, fake news, and the development of oxymoronical concepts like alternative facts. It would be inappropriate to point fingers here regarding who is to blame for our current, problematic political landscape, but it is uncontroversial that the enumerated issues are real and that they have moral implications. 
For example, fake news has become so common that social media groups are on constant watch for the spread of misinformation and provide disclaimers to alert users of potentially fake news. The unfortunate fact, discussed earlier, that many people are unclear about what lying actually is, the public's general lack of information literacy, and a growing acceptance of relativism, all serve to aggravate the problems of the post-truth era. 4. If people don't know what lies are, can't tell the difference between news, ads, or propaganda, and believe that everyone is right about whatever they personally believe, then how can truth ever be salvaged? Our text concludes this section with a series of its own questions for us to consider, namely, do you think the concept of a lie has changed throughout time? Has the political landscape changed so dramatically that the concept of lying has no currency? What is the current moral status of lying? If politicians and constituents do not care about the truth, then does this affect the moral status of lying, at least in the political arena? Obviously, lying at the highest levels of government is a moral problem since its implications aren't merely the concerns of voting citizens, but for the international community as well. 6. Summary Our text concludes, philosophers, in many issues, like to start by asking what we mean by the key term. Once we ask the question, what is it to lie, it becomes quickly apparent that the issues are complex and unclear. To lie does not just mean to say something false, rather it has something to do with trying to get another person to believe what you claim to be true, when you in fact think it is false. Different theories we have looked at so far in this book have different responses to the question, is it wrong to lie? The utilitarian says, it depends. That is, if the consequences of lying are better than telling the truth then we are morally required to lie. The deontologist, the Kantian or divine command theorist for example, thinks that lying is always wrong. There are no situations at all when it would be morally acceptable to lie. Both the consequentialist and the deontologist's responses seem to lead to counterintuitive claims. One possible way to respond to this is to revisit the definition of lying and claim that the counterintuitive responses to moral questions regarding lying arise because of a false or incomplete understanding of what it is to lie. Finally, we might simply reject the requirement of capturing our intuitions at all. We might simply say, so much the worse for our intuitions. We finished this chapter with some general thoughts about truth and lying in the political arena. 7. Questions and Tasks Though our text has left us with a mountain of questions, and the issues to consider section asks 11 more, please at least answer the following before next time. 1. Read 1 through 7 at the start of this chapter. Do you think these are cases of lying or not? Give reasons for your answers. 2. Do you think it makes sense to talk about lying to oneself? If it does, how might this change our definition? 3. If you had to go for either a deontological approach to lying or a consequentialist approach, which would it be and why? 4. Do you think that we are living in a post-truth era? If so, how does this change, if at all, how we think of lying?